What's going on everyone? My name is MG The Future. I want to thank you guys for joining me on my channel tonight. Well, it's nighttime for me. You guys probably aren't going to see this till the next day. But this particular video is um, similar to like the podcast that you probably have checked out. Um, the More Than Beats podcast with Machine Masters. I did three episodes with Booney Mayfield. And, um, and people responding to that now, because we did that over a month ago, um, I feel the need to kind of elaborate on certain things. And I have a bigger topic in mind with a lot of tree branches. So this video is not a t traditional tutorial. It's very similar to my like audio producer discussion and things like that, where I usually have a moment to do philosophy. And this whole video is going to be philosophy video. So my recommendation is if you're not like one of my core subscribers, it's probably not for you. Um, if you're looking to learn something technically, it's not going to be for you. Um, the best way to consume this is probably passively. You know, if you're bored, you could check to finish this video. Or if you're traveling, you could just play it in your speakers because I'm not really going to show you anything. I'm just going to talk to you and express myself. And um, <laughs> I think I know the title of the video to kind of bring people's attention. in, But it's not about the title. It's really not about what I'm going to talk about. Um, I just need this topic as a catalyst to feed everything else that I've been thinking about. So I think the title is going to be, um, <laughs> it's not clickbait, I promise, but it's, it, well, you already saw the title if you're watching me, but it's an extreme assertion, which is going to provoke this discussion. So I think the title is going to be to the effect of why I think the Roland SP404 is a waste of money or time. This isn't true, though it may be true for me. And I'll explain that in great detail in this video. And I needed to explain it because it's going to allow me to explain other things. But first things first, why I'm doing this kind of video. I'm doing this kind of video because as you can see here by clean my Mac, I have 35 gigabytes of space on my hard drive left. Um, and I don't know where it's going. Um, it's not anything I installed recently. It's just eating up space and not returning it to me, um, especially when I do these videos. So I'm going to have to clean it, start over. And in thinking about that, I normally do that every December or November, December anyway, because I always start fresh with a fresh start on the computer, blah, blah, blah. Um, it's just a practice I've been into. That's why I have so many external hard drives. And um, in doing that, I had to ask myself a question like, in 2018, what are my goals? What do I want to accomplish and what do I want to create with? And then me being in the role of an influencer or a person who's teaching others, I still kind of need access to everything. So do I go into this new system clean with just FL Studio and Harrison? Do I go into this new system with just Logic Pro? Um, do I go into this new system with all of them again? Or, you know, do I upgrade Ableton Live 9 to 10? Like, there's a lot of things as a content creator I have to consider tandem or parallel with things I have to consider as a creative person with a very specific goal, which feeds everything else that I do. And I'm sure a lot of you are going to approach this situation the more focus you put into your music, whether that's through your channel, Instagram, Facebook, placement chasing whatever, publishing, whatever, you're going to find situations where you're going to have to make decisions that are based on cold heart reality versus how you feel or how you perceive things. I understand that. And what's interesting, a lot of the feedback I got is kind of e uh, uh, eludes to that. A lot of people have like a lot of a matter of fact statements when they interact with me sometimes, not necessarily on my YouTube comments, but like Facebook especially, people are a little bit more brutal. Um, and Instagram DMs, sometimes. It's just, it's not all bad, it's just, it's eye-opening because I process information different than other people. I get why people say what they say, not necessarily what they're saying. So I'm gonna talk about that. <laughs> but let's start with my thesis. Why the SP404 is a waste? It's not. I will tell you how I got it, what happened, what transpired, and why I don't make as many videos. Um, shout out to uh, Nessa Shogun. Um, I'm actually trying to keep record 
of all the feedback that I get of requests because I want to kind of knock them out. And that's so the Shogun said, please do one specifically to 404SX. What's interesting is a lot of female producers use the SP404. Her, she's talking about it. Olivia was talking about it. Another female was talking about it on my comment section. Um, for you guys, I suggest you guys following Sarah the Instrumentalist. She's a sister with dreads, and she uses SP404. I caught her, like, she had, like, some advertisement on Facebook, and she has a drone. And it was doing sky aerial footage, and I recognized the background. I was like, I live there. <laughs> and um, so I added her on social media because she's local, and she does the performances. She does all the things that I don't do on a local level with the SP404. So you guys should follow her, A, because she's female. And there's, you know, I don't have a bias with that, but it's in terms of a, the connection, it might be better for you guys to, to know that there's another female uh, using SP404 and kicking butt with it. I'm still going to do stuff with it. Don't, I don't want to misconstrue what the topic of this video and this theme of this discussion is, but I'm just, I'm just saluting her because she could be an icon for female producers at some point if that's what her intentions are. Anyway, off that. So those things I'm going to tackle or try to. And of course, I have a video for Machine Masters Wednesday. And I have to beat that around running out of hard drive space, reinstalling everything, and choosing what I'm going to reinstall, and thinking about wasting space in terms of wasting space via programs, via wasting time, via not um, getting straight to the point of what my intentions are. And hopefully that helps you. Um, but with SP404, it came to me via um, someone that I collaborate with, actually. You can't see it in this video, but if you ever look at it, like when I do a zoom in on it or picture in picture of it, it's scuffed. It's an older machine. It's really beat up. And um, this particular person knew, well, they didn't need it anymore, want it no more. So they made me an offer. And they did that based on my history of doing the lo-fi videos and me having a conversation saying that this particular unit is the future for up and coming people because it's our modern MPC. And it's because music is changing towards a lo-fi slash um, Foley sound slash people sampling themselves. This machine is the catalyst for that. Although it's little brother, the 303, or older brother, the 303 in them, Matt, Lib, J. Dillon, all of them had their time, but there's a different demographic that's using it now. And as such, it's always going to become more popular in that demographic. And because it's more popular, more units are going to sell, more are going to go on eBay. The older units are going to resurface. There's going to be discussion about which unit's the best, the same way there was discussions on the 2000 XL versus the 3000. It's repeating, history is repeating itself for the SP the same way it did for the MPC, and I'm witnessed in witnessing both. So I knew it was coming regardless if I participated in the hype or not. But for me, it wasn't hype. It was a law of attraction. It was a, an, a, a personal goal of mine. And what I mean is, I told this story a hundred times. First thing I bought working at McDonald's as a 15 year old was an SP-303. Had no idea what it was. Knew it was capable of, loved the way it sounded, but I couldn't figure out the sequencer, had no clue about resample mode, had no context, had no YouTube, had no Google, no one was willing to help, no one answered questions. I knew one person in my city who had SP-808, he promised that he'd show me some things, he never did. So eventually I sold it. Cool. Fast forward, I saw it happening again. I knew we were, by and large, people are uh, looking for something besides FL Studio, largely. And I'll tie this all together, I promise. Um, so the hardware route and what's affordable was happening. And I was watching people discuss it, kind of like not trolling, but it's called lurking. I was lurking the, the forums for all this stuff. And I can kind of get a compass on where things are going based on analyzing people talking. Um, our language is encoded. I don't want to get too deep or too weird because I don't know where you guys are at with the bigger picture of what life is and why we're here, but suffice it to say, on a root level, most humans are psychic. And although it's not like 
guessing the lottery numbers or being aware of that, no matter what our knowledge is or what our indoctrination is or what we're taught or believe, we're still psychic. Like it's just part of our DNA or who we are. And that psychic tendency comes in speech. So you'll notice a lot of times, especially with females, they'll be like, uh, don't do that tonight. Or if you go out tonight, this, this, and this, this, and this is going to happen. And we've always called that uh, women's intuition. And normally when they have that pulse and that warning and they speak it into existence, it happens, right? Um, it's very interesting in the urban demographic because a lot of people that I know have been locked up and the precursor to them locking, being locked up as a person telling them not to go that particular moment versus all the other moments where they've done similar things, right? So we're psychic on that level. I've always studied this stuff. So anyway, because of that, it's true for all of us. So when you start seeing conversations happen a lot and you start seeing trends and things that go viral or not even things that go viral, things that become popular in subsets of people, their language is going to tell you what's going to happen. Cool. So me being aware of lo-fi and the psychic nature of people pursuing it and people rediscovering what I just call hip hop, <laughs> um, I knew it was coming. Um, something curious happened early before the summertime. Philip Drummond, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but he does like beat battles and teaches kids and all this kind of cool stuff. Very interesting soul when you meet him in person, but and his intentions seemed to be good. But he invited me to this beat battle at Duke and everyone there was performing on SP404. And um, I felt like I was in the twilight zone because of my thesis or my theory about him was plain when I seen it in person. So I came home, understood what they're doing. A lot of them were hacking. They're just loading sessions from Ableton as stems into each pad. And they were fronting, you know what I mean? They weren't like Professor Logic, Mad Lib or anybody. But it was a good machine or catalyst to do that with. To have a centerpiece, to have the lights, to have control over real-time effects. It makes sense to why they would be fronting like that. But, um, I knew it was coming back into my life. So I didn't worry about it. I didn't sweat it really. I worked around it, talked about the Good Hertz plugins, talked about lo fi production. If you look at my Machine Master Summer, you'll see that I've been hearkening about lo fi a whole lot, way more than anyone else in, in regards to how the kind of audience I have. And um, it came to pass. Like I said, someone made me an offer I couldn't refuse, ended up in my life. Um, I understood that psychically and then from there I had the commitment of what really I needed, why I needed it and that was to finish learning it to learn it properly to uh, get that off my chest to put it behind me I got it, read it learned it, taught myself it made some beats, did a course boom what may have should have happened is that the course should have came out on a very basic level to prepare all these people who are flirting with the idea of getting it to meet them there so that they can understand how to use it, what to do when they do get it, or to inform their decision on how to purchase, you know, once they purchase it or if they should purchase it. <clears throat> once I've done that and that particular group of people knew that I did it or, you know, became my audience, for lack of better words, then I could have created or curated content based off of that course and based off of those questions being answered already. Because that particular dynamic never happened and the release was delayed now three to four months, I was in limbo because I had no feedback on if the course is any good, first of all. You know, there's a part of me that's like, yo, it's good. But there's also another part of me where it's like I'm hypercritical of myself and my content. So I had no feedback. I had no compass on how many people would gravitate towards it. I had no compass on, you know, there's a lot of different things that are different then than it is now because it's becoming more popular. It's going to be exponential by springtime. But because it didn't roll out ever, I kind of was like, all right, I'll do more once it comes out. Two, three, four months went by. Never came out. Still not out as of this video. It's really not a fault. It's just an executive decision on the Machine Master's platform. I have to respect it. I can release it myself, but uh, I'm not I'm not in it for that. So I've kept myself busy. Um, 
And then as a sidebar, every time I did something else or, you know, I came up on a sample track and this is kind of psychic too. the uh, Zoom sample track. And I've said this and I think people think I'm joking. I'm not. I think it's from a parallel universe. <laughs> and if you guys are interested in that theory, let me know. I'll do a whole different video showing you why this is a different universe. But anyway, because of the nature of how I discovered it, what I found and um, my instinct, my intuition is saying that what I'm actually looking for is a sample track and um, couldn't find it for years. This is before the SP404 aha moment earlier this year. This is like two years ago. I was like, I need the sample track and I couldn't find it. You can never find them on sale. It's really hard to do. And um, so I set up an alert. I got the alert whenever I got the sample track a week prior and I bought it that week. Um, no hesitation. And it felt un felt like I was in the matrix, like time froze. Like it didn't make sense, but I needed to complete that particular impulse. And I got it and I used it and I learned it largely in part in hindsight, me learning the SP the hard way made me learning the sample track easier. Me understanding the limitations of the SP for me, not as a performer, not as an effects box, but as a producer, as making beats, made me appreciate the sample track. So that's why my theme is the SP-404 is a waste. Not a waste in itself, it's a waste for me because the sample track effectively replaced my will or desire to do lo-fi on SP-404. <laughs> here's the fork in the road though, Here, here's the uh, rub. <clears throat> people are still asking me to do 404 videos one so i will two the course hasn't come out yet right so if i sell this or do anything with it if the course comes out after my impulsive response i'm going to end up attracting a lot more sp404 users and not actually have sp404 that's going to be useless um i can't encourage or influence people to get a sample track because it took me two years to get it. The waiting line for any significant amount of people to get one is going to be unrealistic because I've emailed Zoom three times now to reissue them or to recreate them or just to increase the internal memory and call it an anniversary release and they refuse to do it. So I, I it's odd. It's a very odd circumstance. So I kind of have to use that by myself on my own time <laughs> and I understand that. But me as a teacher, I have to keep the SP-404 too, because although my job was done for me personally, my own personal overcoming of it, and it also being a catalyst for being prolific at the sample track, um, unlike me getting rid of the 303, me detaching myself from the SP-404 is harder. Although I, I, haven't <laughs> I haven't made anything crazy with it and sold any beats like I would have with other things. It's just here and it's just attention. But because of the psychic nature of what's going on with lo-fi, um, I understand it's a cat it's going to be a catalyst for attention. And as a YouTube channel, that's something you would want to consider and think about. Similar to like how my channel is largely FL Studio for Mac. Well duh. Um, if I go to my channel and I go to home, I see that seven other people who it suggests that I should subscribe to or my viewers should subscribe to based on my content. I'm aware of them. I just don't check out their stuff, but they don't do FL Studio for Mac. That's a conscious decision on my part. It's logical. I was a 10 years plus FL Studio user. So doing videos for FL Studio for Mac make perfect sense. But also, is that a waste of time? Think about it. I have logic. <laughs> <laughs> arguably the most complete universal package of DAWs. Ableton Live, arguably the best lo-fi sample based DAW if you if you use it that way, or EDM even. I have a machine. Let, let's talk about all of it. So let's talk about machine first. Machine. <laughs> okay. So Machine is the most interesting of the two, of all of, of everything. Even it's more interesting than SP404 to me because the demographic for people who are good at m machine is marginally wider. Like on SP404, because we're 
codifying it as a lo-fi machine, it's almost a pass for creativity. And what I mean is everything you make on it is going to be good to someone because it's different. It's going to be seen as like the uh, purest method of making music. So even if you're not technically good at it, people are going to like hit like on it because it's a SP404 beat. Now, when you get to the machine, it's different. Um, we They try to market it as like the go-to for these people who release the expansions, the go-to for these EDM producers. When the MK3 rolled out, it was very apparent that they're reaching out to anyone who had any sort of influence and gave them early advances of these machines. That means they're trying to set the bar for the type of clients or culture the machine means. And unfortunately for them, they left me out of that. Because my relationship with Native Instruments, like, I don't know if you guys know this, but two of my songs are in the machine library. So however many people have Machine 2.0, that's how many people have heard of me before, if they ever went through the demo songs. And um, me knowing that, and me being an early person to do tutorials and being part of Machine Masters, which was one of the first platforms to do tutorials for it, and me knowing how prolific I am at explaining things about it, <clears throat> I try to build a better relationship with Native Instruments so that I can help them make it better. So it wouldn't have to be a situation where I had to make machine beats and export them to Pro Tools or make machine beats and export them to Logic. I can make machine beats and finish them in machine. And I've had various scenarios where I've interacted with that company directly. I've had various scenarios where I reached out to other people independently. Um, there's a lot of different things behind the scenes. I guess I'm just not at liberty to talk about, but they can't force me not to talk about it too because they're not helping me with what I'm talking about. So because they want it really, uh, I'll, I'll use a different word. I felt unappreciated by them. And in my book, that's wild because I go harder than anyone else that they sponsored. If I keep it a buck, these people you see flashing MK3 and turning the lights on and playing with these presets, they're all whack. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant. Yeah, I am. They're all whack. Let's keep it 100. I haven't heard a good demo from MK3 yet. I haven't heard anything tangible to the kind of music we make in the urban, urban demographic yet. I know Knife Wonder got it and all that, but let's keep it a buck. Knife Wonder Fruity Loop beats were better than his machine beats. It is what it is. And that's not a shot at him per se. It's just they're doing the, they're trying to be the Valenciaga, the uh, Margellus. They're trying to be that of beat makers. And they're not. They need to calm down and get on the Akai SP level first and pimp it out and give us the features and create the culture of users and the type of and acknowledge the kind of music we want to make with it and give us tools that match that. Instead, they prolong it. And all right, we're going to give you audio here. All right, then we're going to plan for these tractor features here. All right, then we're going to do time stretch there. And in the meantime, as they stretch out this so-called development, which Harrison Mixbus fi figured out through open architecture, they're going to sell us things in the meantime. And this is not their words. This is I'm not getting this from them. This is my perception of what they're doing. And the psychic nature of me knows that this is for business. For them, it's not for our culture. For them, it's not for making the tools easier to use or better to use, at least in time with our growth and development. Because we're going to over... It's going to be left behind by default. It's always going to be kind of like, you know, the core Triton where you used to see it in every studio background picture and everyone had it. But when you listen to their music, it's not Triton sounds. They're complete and their keyboard is different. I think that's why they did that. Well, you can still use our complete if you have our keyboard and use that and whatever. But machine is going to be halted because they refuse to incorporate <laughs> my suggestions. And that sounds really bad saying it out loud, but it's the truth. And it's not just my suggestions. A lot of people suggest the same thing I suggest, of course. But I've had this conversation with them, and I don't see I don't see it changing. And also, when the MK3 came out, now I'll put this in the context, I did all those machine videos for Machine Masters, and a lot of people don't know there's a difference between Native Instruments and Machine Masters. 
So a lot of people were commenting on my videos for, for the machine like I was them. And a lot of people inboxed me like I was them and I wasn't. And I made sure all of my feedback was positive about them. And I made sure that if people had questions about what expansion packs to do for the J Dilla and what to do this or do this, I pointed it to them. I have a Google URL shortener that keeps track of every outgoing link. And it shows me how many times people visit things. And I kept track of that. And I just, <laughs> there's levels to this. But anyway, my rapport with them is always good. Like I joined Machine Masters, I taught it. I did the demos for the thing. I've done more demos for other companies using the thing. I've done videos for it in multiple channels. I've taught people, I've been in the groups. I was on like 20 native instruments, machine groups, answering questions, building relationships. Most of you know me from that. And then when it, time, it came time for the uh, 3.0 and MK3 conversation, they no longer know who I am or they can't answer my questions. Or I asked them, who are these people that are getting these early and why does it make sense for you to make sure those people who are sending them out get in contact with me? I don't have a problem paying for it. I just need it ahead of time so I can be ahead of the curve with the content rather than last minute and everyone's like, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. I didn't get no response. So as such, my dispensation towards them as a company and me wasting my time on machine was solidified. That was the end of my era. My machine uh, foray was to learn the hybrid workflow of hardware and software. Never being an MPC user, it bridged me into their world, their understanding, and I see what it's the benefits of that. And then I see what I didn't like about it and what I could do faster. Cool. And then that got me onto Machine Masters, which arguably created a bigger platform for me in terms of teaching, which then catapulted this channel. Cool. Now that that particular season's over, I don't need Machine anymore. Because of my intentions and my psychic uh, intuition about the future, I can't do with them because they don't have my vision. And they don't have to. They're going to be fine without me because their marketing is great. The graphics are beautiful and their products are very nice to look at. But in terms of creating a subculture and a sound from it, similar to how FL Studio was the subculture of trap, machine doesn't have a chance. Not with lo-fi being born. So I sold my jam already. So sold my jam around the time sample track came. So it's all part of that process. My MK2, I'm trying to sell, but no one wants to buy it. <laughs> so I have it, and sometimes I get a request to do a machine video, and I was hoping uh, the machine 3.0 came out this year so I can you know, tackle that, provide some farewell content, but it ain't happening. So when I reinstall this computer, get more space, is machine gonna be there? Probably not. So I'm not gonna be able to do future videos on machine. And if I kind of unauthorize everything, I probably just give it to my brother or something, to be honest with you. I might not even not authorize. I might just give him my account to log into. So that's that. That's <laughs> that's SP404. Really not over for that, but that's my sentiment about it. That's machine. Boom. Fast forward. Ableton. Ableton's interesting because they didn't do nothing to me. Ableton for me is a, is a hallmark for remixing. Like... There's no other program outside of like Serato's DJ stuff that deals with acapellas, timing, uh, warp markers and stuff as prolific as Ableton Live does. In last two or three years, I've done a lot of remixes, not as much now. And I needed something that helped me line those up. And I always knew Ableton could do that. So that's why I got it. And then the added bonus of the extract audio to MIDI. Um, the problem I then had was, well, to really take advantage of Ableton and their decisions forward as a culture, their push culture. And I would have to get a push. And my conflict was, all right, do I buy a machine studio or jam or do I buy a push? And at the time of that decision, it was like, jam makes sense because it's new for native instruments. They're going in the right direction. There should be a software date behind this, a software update behind this. And of course we can use jam with Ableton. Well, I tried that. I gave it a valiant effort <laughs> and I didn't like it because there's no readout, there's no details, it's kind of color-coded, you can customize it. But I'm not trying to be a computer programmer for workflow. It's just not in my DNA. It's a waste of time. So I never got push. But Ableton's curious too. 
they're Germans as well. In fact, I think they're neighbor, neighbors to Native Instruments, so this all makes sense on a macro. But um, I reached out to them, and I showed them that my Ableton Live videos, like the Kanye one is like 300,000 views, the Ninth Wonder one's like 90,000, the Tribe Called Quest one's like 200,000. Like collectively, it's like 2 million views on my Ableton Live videos, and I have over 60 of them. And I kind of showed them that. I was trying to get a, a better relationship with them than I had with Native Instruments and didn't you know different people in that. And they're pretty much radio silent. They don't need me. Although, arguably, a lot of people are asking me about Ableton because of the work I did for Ableton. <laughs> I bought Ableton Live, you know what I mean? Because cause of the remix thing and the warp markers. But um, the through mode for Simpler was a good touch. But then it came too late because Serato Sampo introduced, introduced that with the key detection. And then they still don't, they, I think Ableton 10 now has ghost channels. That was one of my recommendations too. I don't know if anyone knows that, but I've talked about that a long time. I shared all these ideas with them on how to make Ableton better. 10 by and large included them. Now, was it just me? Probably not, but knowing the email that I sent them and the correspondence I had and how they responded to the amount of attention I got for Ableton Live videos, it was very thankless on their part. So, when I reinstall everything, am I going to have, well, not Ableton Live 9, am I going to upgrade to Ableton 10 and uh, get rid of the MK2 and get a push instead? Probably not. <clears throat> because they don't need me. Their demographic's not hip-hop. Um, it should be because of lo-fi producers, but it's not. Their focus, just like Native Instruments' focus, is techno and house and EDM. And it's sad but in their international market, <clears throat> it makes sense. In the American market, where everyone's still pirating FL Studio, which is only $99, they know you guys aren't going to spend, not you guys, but the people pirating FL Studio, they know those guys are not going to spend $800 for software anyway. So they're not going to try to make any accommodations for them just for it to be pirated by that demographic. You understand? They, they've, these companies have the research and data to match who's buying it, and the kind of music they make. And I know that because all of them send surveys and I've answered all the surveys. And I've talked to them too. I've talked to the people who develop some of this stuff in the behind the scenes on Skype and all that. And um, they don't make our music. So <laughs> Ableton Live's out, Machine is out. SP404 is on the bench. Um, and then I guess to kind of tie this all together and why I wanted to share these thoughts with you guys is because I teach so much stuff like Harrison Mixbus was this week. Prior to that was FL Studio real hard. Prior to that was Repro 5. And it's because what I'm doing is that as I'm experimenting and looking for what's the best for a certain workflow or job, I'm sharing with you what the best is at the moment. In all honesty, Repro 5 is the best fake analog synthesizer available to us. It's the best sounding. It sounds better than Diva. I have a demo of Diva. It sounds thin. And I get it, it's for creating your own sounds, but that's whack. I ain't got time for that, if the if it sounds thin. <clears throat> oh, put it in HQ mode. No, Repro 5, I just play a key, and it sounds wonderful. So that, Harrison Mix Bus. Let's be practical about it, guys. It's $29. It was a Black Friday sale. I end up being able to take advantage of that. I end up learning it in three hours tops, and I end up doing four tutorials on it over the weekend. And everything that I poured into it from FL Studio sounded better to me. There's no discussion, this dope. Um, and then a lot of important questions come up, especially with Harrison, it's like, well, you have you have a Logic, Ableton, this, that. Won't you use those? Why would you incorporate Harrison? Largely because I'm getting away from those programs. Because for me, it's about wasting time. And it's not like this for everybody. Some people just like their gear, you know, they have a bond with it and they just want to create, and it's their free time thing, it's their side hustle, it's their hobby. For me, it's my full-time thing. I'm always making music, no matter what dispensation or time I've been in. I have sacrificed relationships to make music. So for me, it's very important. And if I feel like the company doesn't understand that about creatives, or if I feel like uh, they're not moving in the direction that I need them to in terms of features and functions, and I don't have to keep being modular about jumping back and forth between them I don't need them 
because they're not thinking about me. And this is very subtle. It's not a direct thing. They appease us with certain features, but they're not trying to really. No one really addresses hip hop. <laughs> it's 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 weird. If it wasn't for trap, Fruity Loops wouldn't either. But anyway, off that. So Harrison is me looking for the answer of can I um, manage the outboard stuff and the mixing stuff without an Ableton? Answer is yes. I'm not going to have warp markers, but I guess I'm not going to be warping for a little while. <laughs> Especially with lo-fi, it's not, not, even, not even a thing they really need to do. Unless we're doing remixes, but I was talking about publishing, so I'm not using other people's acapellas anyway to publish or put on free for social media on SoundCloud and YouTube because they're being taken down by audio Mac, like suspended my new South Kings account because I had remixes. Uh, SoundCloud gives my place to universal on new South Kings because of a vocal sample, a very short segment. Um, everyone is attacking remix culture and always has in, in hip hop, especially EDM. They seem not to care because I could find a thousand EDM remixes of some stuff. But when it comes to mind on my channel and it's a hip hop joint, all of a sudden I have to take it down or, you know, whatever it is, what it is. But, um, so I'm not going to be doing that anyway, unless it's a real artist. So don't need warp markers no more, man. Everything's kind of creating a path for me. It's me trying all these things, trying to figure out what's what me teaching it as I go. And then the universe closing doors and then opening up new ones. And the crux of this conversation is that in 2018, I need to be more prolific in terms of uh, my output of my personal music, because I'm always going to do this channel. Um, but I need to get serious about DistroKid, which is what I, I I bought it the other week. And I was thinking, marinating on like, yo, what am I actually going to release? What am I actually going to make? And I, I figured it out. And I'll talk about that later. But um. Can I do that without these things that I talked about? Yes. <laughs> so I'm going to do that. Try that experiment. Follow my intuition down that path and see what happens. Um, and likely it's going to get me a lot of placements and opportunities because it's so me. I finally figured me out. So I'm going to go full steam with that coming into next year. And I kind of wanted to share all that with you guys because... It may seem a certain way from the outside looking at, or you might feel the same way about your particular path and development. And, you know, it, it's not a big deal on a surface, like what program you use, but it's a big deal when you think about culture, when you think about money, because money is an exchange for attention or convenience. And it's a big deal when we think about the ramifications of us co-signing and, um, influencing and supporting certain people who fundamental, fundamentally on an energetic level don't necessarily resonate with us. That's someone else's job. It's not our job. And I had to learn that the hard way. Even with like a, with like the podcasting, like um, we're at three episodes and I was ready for episode four, five, six. For whatever reason, the universe put a halt there um a certain guest that i wanted to bring on never responded to my facebook messages or whatever like because i was telling them that uh we might have to change format whatever and they just didn't respond but it says scene of course so i reached out to them every two days like once every two days and they kind of just kept saying scene but they didn't respond so i blocked them <laughs> i was like there's no need for you to interact with me or to see my content if you're not going to answer me and be a decent human being about it. And simultaneously, as that was transpiring separate privately, the issues with uh, changing direction on the platform's behalf with Machine Masters, they're going in a different direction. But then it causes a type of strife with people who hit me up. Like five people hit me up today, say, yo, I saw that podcast today. That was so crazy. Or that helped me. Or I like you know, those points you guys made and there's, it's on YouTube. Now there's comments on it on the machine master channel. And it's unfortunate because I can't propagate it or engage or put on like I should and would be doing because it's not going nowhere after that. Like that was the last episode. Right. So 
it, it, it's a learning experience. It's a, it's a big learning experience. And you're going to run into these roadblocks too. Trust me. You're going to, <laughs> you're going to buy that M machine MK3 and soon realize it's still machine 2.0. You're going to end up buying Ableton Live 10 and realize Fruity Loop still does that better. It, it's, it's different for different people for different things. But what I'm saying is that's part of the process. Um, but what makes that process extreme, and this is my last point, is that my intentions are different than most people. Most people are happy being creative, artists, purists, hobbyists, passive. My intention is always to be the best. <clears throat> and that's not well received, so I don't say it out loud a whole lot. But my intention is to be the best. And um, contrary to popular belief, um, when we have the conversation of what's important, the samurai or the sword, what's important is both the samurai and the sword. A very common example of that is that the samurai metaphor is meant for the practitioner, for the person who's achieved mastery, usually after 10,000 hours with the thing. The samurai can handle a lot of different scenarios, no matter what you throw in his hands. He can defend himself. He can win battles, fights, etc. But when we're talking about music producers being samurais, and we're talking about the sword being the SP, the FL, the Ableton, the sword then represents creative output. So you have two different samurais with the same sword. Let's say Ableton Live. One's doing lo-fi, one's doing EDM. At that point, the sword is the same, but is their output the same? Probably not. And there's outside factors that influence that. How fast are they able to learn? How intuitive is the software? Is there resources online to help them get better? Is there sound packs and things that are being created to help them grow and develop in that particular genre that they're using for the format that they're using via Ableton Live? Or Reason, and that's Reason's biggest problem. They had a closed platform and it was hard for people who were sound designing and creating content to enter the Reason platform because it was closed. So therefore Ableton took the share, etc. So everyone's gonna say, well, anyone with Ableton can make anything. That's not true. It's not true. It's not true at all. Theoretically, it's true. In practice, it's not. The best hip hop producers don't use Ableton. We have a shift happening where uh, Timberland's using it, Pharrell's using it, and um, quite a few other old school producers are going to it. But they're not the best producers no more. The trap producers are. The trap producers are using FL Studio and they have no intentions on changing. And that's because people don't understand culture. Our culture is in trap. The subgenres of pop music are now trap drums with pianos, etc. Despacito and reggaeton and Cuban and all that stuff. There's trap versions of it. There's trap versions of reggae. There's trap of everything. And if FL Studio is the culture catalyst for trap, then no. No one wants to hear it out of Ableton Live. No one really wants to teach it. And I guess that's why people ask me to talk about it and teach it and why I have so many Ableton Live videos showing you that it can be done functionally. But if I do an FL Studio, I get a totally different response and engagement. So me being the samurai, I can do trap in all of them, but the sword does matter. It, it connects me to my culture. It connects me to my task. My task is different. Um, so you would have to negotiate that too. When you guys are talking about getting SP 404, are you trying to perform? Are you trying to get in the lo-fi community? Are you looking for engagement from other SP users? Are you ready for debates on which one sounds best? 404, SX, 303, 505, 606? If so, yes, then yes, you need one. But if I tell you my sample track is 10 times faster at doing what this does for creating beats, people look at me like I was funny. And if I dare say that the medium quality on drums sound like the NPC on the sample track and the swing on it sounds like the NPC, and maybe that's why it's discontinued, people will also look at me like I'm crazy because they never touched one. So <laughs> I'm rambling at this point, guys. My apologies. Like I said, not promoting or propagating this video. It's just for my core audience. Kind of show you where my thoughts are at. The big, the big takeaway, though, is that I'm running out of hard drive space. So within this next week or two, I'm gonna have to knock out a couple of videos real fast and have some downtime to erase everything, 
reinstall Omnisphere, which took me two days last time, or not. <laughs> I've been getting it off with Serum lately, bro. Serum and Repro 5. I might not need anything else. Nah. I need real sounds. Oh, East West. But I got the external hard drive for that, so it only takes a second to install that. See what I mean? It, it's it gets weird because it's gonna it's strongly gonna be influenced by what kind of music I'm gonna make, um, and the kind of sounds I'm using are largely uh, synthetic now. Although I kind of want to do the lo-fi and sample myself, but I'm gonna do that synthetically. I'm not gonna try to. I'm I'm not trying to recreate the beauty of orchestras and funk and soul with strings and stuff. I'm going to make that same music synthetically and still capture that vibe because it's really the key that is the magic, not the instrument. It's the space that is the magic, not the instrument. Um, it's the voice more so than anything, if we're honest. So there's levels, folks. <laughs> but I'm just babbling. I thank you guys for tuning in. Um, comments, questions, or concerns, or any part of that topic that's unclear or you want me to expand on, I'd be more than happy to. Since I no longer have a platform for the podcast, and you, some of you have probably engaged with that, you can ask those questions here. Um, I'll see what I can do about that in the future if things change, um, and I'll let you guys know. Um, if you have comments, questions, or concerns about any of these programs, in the future direction of future videos before I uninstall everything this week to, you know, reinstall my Mac, let me know. Maybe <laughs> you guys will change my mind about which programs I should keep or should proceed with. Um, but with the samurai example, I'm always going to be a samurai, but the sword has to be sharp. And I have to be using that sword in the right battles. And I'm just not battling with the uh, the German influence on pop culture and hip hop and its unappreciation for us as both users, producers, influencers, and our buying power, which they think underva is undervalued because they believe we're the pirates or most likely to pirate, <clears throat> but we know the demographics and numbers on the internet of who those people are looking at the languages and the pirated software. So that's a different topic for a different day. That's a little bit more heavy. But until next time, peace.